Good afternoon. Thank you for, uh, for attending and welcome to the fourth presentation in the history of the University of Cincinnati. Uh, today we're going to be looking at our student pioneers. If you're the sort of person who's fascinated by comic books, you know that origin stories are always among the top sellers. Superman leaves Krypton, Spider-Man loses his Uncle Ben, Bone gets kicked out of Boneville. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you ought to look up Jeff Smith's comic. So we're going to look at this today as the University of Cincinnati's origin story. And we're going to be looking at four unique individuals who have helped define our destiny as a university. In previous sessions, we've gone geographically wide and chronologically long. And today we're going to go deep with a fairly extended look at just four individuals. All of these students graduated from the University of Cincinnati when we were located in the old campus down the hill from our current location. This is an old uh, uh, lithograph that kind of shows the Bellevue incline going up to the Bellevue House, which used to sit atop uh, Bellevue Hill where Bellevue Park is. You can see the university building over here on the side, uh, Clifton Avenue, and then down at the bottom at Micken Avenue at the top of Elm Street where the streetcars would, uh, would head up to the Bellevue House. Now as we get into the session today, we're going to be reminded of the racism and sexism that you discover when you get involved in historical research. Because two of the graduates that we're going to be focusing on have no known surviving photographic images. And they are uh, not the white males uh, who are involved today. It is our first woman graduate and our first African American graduate. And the search to document uh, these pioneers is still continuing. So I'd like to, uh, to thank for contributing her formidable research skills to this effort, Paulette Pensvalto, who is here today. Thank you, Paul. We're going to start with Frank McFarland, who is the very first graduate of the University of Cincinnati. Frank McFarland, Frank Gressinger McFarland, class of 1877, was in fact the entire class of 1877. Of the 58 students who were enrolled at the University of Cincinnati for its first session in September of 1873, it was only Frank who progressed on schedule and was able to graduate in a four-year period. And so for one year, Frank Gressinger McFarland constituted the entire alumni association of the new University of Cincinnati. The university's inaugural graduate was the grandson of Ohio pioneers. Frank's paternal grandparents and their nine children immigrated from England in the early 1830s and purchased 70 acres of rolling land on the west side of Cincinnati near Cheviot where they tended pigs, chickens, milk cows, and three more children. The family farm prospered, and when Frank's grandfather died of pneumonia in 1839, his widowed grandmother kept farming until her own death at the age of 81 in 1873. She left a substantial estate to her nine surviving children. That estate 
or at least part of it, is known today as McFarland Woods in the Hamilton County Park District. When Frank's grandfather died, his two oldest sons left the farm to find work. The oldest, Thomas, became a manufacturer. Frank's father, known as James, was the second oldest, and he became a grocer. James married a lady named Catherine, Mary Catherine McGill, who was descended from an old Virginia family. The marriage produced four children, of which Frank, uh, born in 1854, was the baby. He grew up in relative comfort in a large house on 9th Street. Frank was in the audience when Cornelius Comagius introduced land, a landmark resolution to the Cincinnati City Council to force the city to actually go ahead and found a, a university as was laid out in the McMicken Will. City Council at that time was located in the city buildings which occupied the site of City Hall today, but they looked like this. And Frank, in his memoirs, remembered that day when he was ready to present the subject of the university to city council, several high school boys, including the speaker, were present, Garland said. With a strong appeal to the president of council, Comagius demanded the attention of its members, saying, among other things, that he had sought election to council for the purpose of securing aid for the University of Cincinnati, and that he had not bothered before with ordinances or other speeches, and therefore claimed the right to address council and demand their attention. The speech was effective, and the measure carried. Although Frank planned to go east to college when he left high school, as he put it, certain obstacles arose. There was a, uh, a very severe depression going on at the time, but for whatever reason, Frank joined some 150 high school graduates who applied for admission to the brand new University of Cincinnati through the headmaster, George Harper, who was the principal of Woodward High School. From this group of 150, Harper allowed only eight, uh, 58 that included 18 men and 40 women to enroll in university classes that were held at this old Woodward High School building. For the first year, in fact, the, uh, the faculty was um, recruited from the faculty of Woodward High School. Recitations were scheduled each day from 2 p.m. until 5 p.m. after the high school students had left. For the second year, the university recruited some uh, top-notch professionals of Eastern pedigree by offering very high salaries for the time, $3,500 a year, uh, to come west and teach in Cincinnati. And for that second year, classes met in Cincinnati's third intermediate school near Woodward on Franklin Street. There was only one sophomore, and that was Frank McFarland. Many of Frank's uh, classes were full of freshmen, but he was also offered private instruction with several faculty members, especially uh, the professor of philosophy, F.D. Allen. The only thing approaching college life, Frank said later, was the formation of a male quartet. The entire sophomore class was the first tenor. In 1875, the university opened its third year of classes in the brand new McMicken Hall at the top of Elm Street with small classes and no tutors. Unlike the larger universities on the East Coast, students have ready access to their professors and many appreciated this distinct advantage. Frank remembered especially the long walks he made 
each Saturday as he accompanied Professor Wayland Benedict from the McMicken estate downtown to the post office. And eventually, after a couple of years at this new location, Frank filled his term book and he presented a thesis. The trustees met and they voted to give this single student the degree of Bachelor of Arts. Frank remembered that a diploma in regular form was not given to him because the university hadn't decided on the form of its diplomas. Instead, there was a handwritten statement to the effect that the university had, degree, had conferred the degree uh, of Bachelor of Arts on this student, signed by Rufus King, who was the chairman of the board at the time, and also signed by T.B. Disney, who was the clerk at the time. A year later, the university got in touch with Frank and gave him a standard diploma and took back this handwritten one. Frank recalled some years later, I have tried a number of times to secure that paper, but without effect. I suppose it was thrown away some 20 years ago. Throughout college, Frank had developed a profound interest in philosophy, and he was also interested in music. He performed as an organist from the time he was 13, and he was very devout in his Baptist faith. It was this faith that brought him to the Newton Theological Institute, known today as uh, the Newton Theological School in Andover, outside Boston. And it was at this school that Frank earned a Master of Divinity degree, and it was also here where he met Caroline Lyon Bond. They married in 1881, and they returned to Cincinnati, where Carrie, as she was known, was the organist for a while at Cincinnati's First Baptist Church. Frank himself knew a fair amount about organ music, and in 1882, while he was doing some postgraduate work in Boston, he published a book, The Carpenter Method for Reed Organs, through the E.P. Uh, Carpenter Organ uh, Company. He also published sheet music, one example of which, Here the Angels, a Carol, is in the collection of the Library of Congress. Frank's studies led to ordination to the Baptist clergy in 1883, and he led a uh, congregation in Columbus, Ohio for a while before accepting the call to the first Burlington Baptist Church in Vermont. Frank's brief tenure there ended when his beloved Carrie succumbed to typhoid at the age of 31. The church historian remembers that poor Reverend McFarland tried to stay on and serve his people, but ultimately in April of 1891, he resigned and left for his family home in Ohio. Frank found a position in Hamilton, Ohio, where he married Mary Ellen Henninger, in 1893, and over the next decade or so, Frank and Mary welcomed five children at parsonages in Mansfield, Westwood, and Harris Park. In November 1900, the University of Cincinnati's Alumni Association invited Frank to share his memories of his first years at their alma mater. His remarks have been preserved in a pamphlet of about 12 pages, laced with nostalgia and, and some good humor. Over the years, Frank continued his education, earning a doctorate in theology from Wesleyan University, a PhD in philosophy from the University of Cincinnati. In 1905, he published a number of books and pamphlets on organ music, family life, philosophy, and tithing. In 1915, a new Baptist church organized in Fort Thomas, Kentucky, and invited Frank to, uh, to, to take over the chair. He accepted and shepherded them through their first few years while they held services in the central public school building and raised funds for their first building. Unfortunately, Frank did not live to see it built. The so-called Spanish flu pandemic was raging in February 1919, and Frank succumbed and died at his home 
on West 9th Street on February 25th at the age of 64. He's buried at Spring Grove Cemetery. The next student we'll look at is Winona Lee Hawthorne from the second class at the university, 1878. There are strongs, or there are signs that Winona was a strong woman. She graduated from college, first of all, at a time when very few women pursued education much beyond primary school. Every one of her daughters attended college. One of her daughters, one of her granddaughters, and one of her great-granddaughters is named for her. She endured military life on the American frontier, and she held a passport. Her travels took her through a great part of the continental United States. She was the first woman to graduate from the University of Cincinnati, and she was, in fact, the only woman in the university's first real graduating class. The path to that diploma began in Minnesota, where Winona Lee Hawthorne was born in 1856. She was the first child born to Louise and Leroy Hawthorne. Her father was from West Virginia, but moved out to Newport, Kentucky uh, to go into business. And it was there that he met and married Louise Smith from nearby Boone County. Opportunity called the newlyweds northward to Winona, Minnesota. The town was less than five years old, but it was already the main port for shipping down the Mississippi River from what was, at the time, the United States' primary grain-producing region. Leroy kept the books at Henry Huff's brand new hotel, and when his daughter was born, it was natural to name her Winona. The name does not honor the town, but it honors, like the town, the daughter of a legendary Minnesota Indian chief, and Winona means firstborn daughter. By 1861, the Hawthorns had returned to northern Kentucky, and with the onset of the Civil War, Leroy's hotel experience had prepared him for a posting as a quartermaster. He served with distinction in several campaigns and was promoted to brevet major. While still serving in the war, Campbell County elected Leroy three times to the state legislature. After the war, he was elected to city office in Newport, and the family was politically connected and economically secure. A newspaper profile of Leroy describes his daughter as, quote, a local pride. She is, according to the Daily Commonwealth, an accomplished lady of brilliant intellectuality. Although living in Newport, she attended the old Hughes High School on Fifth Street in the West End. It appears that Winona began taking classes at the University of Cincinnati almost as soon as they were available. But she appeared for several years as what was called a special student. Today, we might call them a part-time student or a non-traditional student. Several of these uh, special students took classes but weren't following a curriculum that leading to a gradua uh, graduation or a degree. But Winona must have accumulated a fair number of credits because the roster for 1877-78 shows her as a fourth-year candidate for the BA degree. There were only eight students in that second class, receiving their degrees from the University of Cincinnati on June 20, 1878, in a ceremony at Pike's Opera House. The newspapers described a large and cultured audience. Each graduate was required to read a baccalaureate essay. And according to the Cincinnati Inquirer, the general tone of the essays suggested that the tendency of the young mind at Cincinnati University is to grapple with social problems. The social problem grappled with by Winona Hawthorne 
was titled A Plea for the Classics. The Enquirer pronounced the essay good and reported that Hawthorne read it so well as to make the very best impression upon the audience. The production is highly creditable to the young lady who enjoyed the prestige of being the first lady who graduated at the university. The Cincinnati Gazette acclaimed her really able and convincing thesis. Few better pleas for the outlook of classical instruction could be presented than the indication afforded by this essay and the thoroughness of Miss Hawthorne's classical training and influence upon her own purity of literary style and elegance of diction are evident. She awakened genuine enthusiasm in the audience and was heartily complimented at the close. The hometown newspaper, the Newport Local, cited the particular pride it had when it called attention to one of Newport's most estimable young ladies. She is a young lady whose amiability, pleasing manners, and industry in the way of literary and other educational attainments present an example which could be followed to great advantage by many other young ladies of this city. Although now holding a degree, Winona continued to enroll at the University of Cincinnati with a couple of other postgraduate students, among them a guy named William Howard Taft. The inaugural issue in February 1880 of the university's first student newspaper, the Bellatrosco, carried an alumni note indicating that Miss Winona Lee Hawthorne was available for tutoring in Latin and Greek at her home in Newport. It's unlikely that he stopped by for a lesson in the classics but a young army lieutenant by the name of William Langdon Buck seems to have made Winona's acquaintance at about this time. Almost simultaneously with Winona's graduation from the University of Cincinnati, Lieutenant Buck had graduated from West Point. He was a proud son of Alabama, and he symbolized the national healing taking place after the Civil War because he was one of the first Southern cadets enrolled at West Point. Although William graduated in the top half of his class, the very idea of a Southern boy in a Yankee uniform was still so new that Lieutenant Buck returned with some trepidation to Alabama on furlough, but he was well received. By the time he settled into Kentucky's Newport barracks, Lieutenant Buck had already been stationed in Atlanta, Baton Rouge, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. It's not entirely clear how he made his acquaintance with Winona, but her father's army connections probably played some part. In any event, the Daily Commonwealth of Covington reported the marriage of Winona to Lieutenant W.L. Buck on December 20, 1881. Lieutenant Buck appears to have entered into matrimony while on leave, because the military records of the time place him in New Mexico at the time of his wedding. It was there in New Mexico that he constructed telegraph lines in the area around Fort Wingate, which is near modern Gallup. And he also commanded rifle teams. On a break from frontier duty, Lieutenant Buck accepted a three-year assignment as professor of military science and tactics at the Mississippi Agricultural and Mechanical College, now known as Mississippi State University. While Winona accompanied him on that assignment, she appears to have remained at Fort Sill in what is now Oklahoma, or at her in-law's home in Mobile, Alabama, or at her parents' house in Newport, while he was engaged in assignments in Reno, Fort Logan, Colorado, and some other hostile locations. Nevertheless, the Bucks were blessed by three daughters between 1882 and 1886. Winona Hawthorne Buck, Louise Langdon Buck, and Leroy, yes, Leroy Langdon Buck. The Spanish-American War at first found Captain Buck 
very busy as the mustering officer for the entire state of Wisconsin, but he was assigned to the Philippines where he was commanding officer of the 13th Inf Infantry Regiment's 3rd Battalion. By the time he returned stateside in 1902, he'd been promoted to major. The next few years are a whirl of assignments in California, Kentucky, Illinois, West Point, Alaska, Tennessee, and Indiana. And it was during this time that we get a look at Winona Hawthorne Buck, because in 1904, at the age of 47, she applied for a passport. In the absence of a photograph, it's the best description we have. The application records her as five foot, six and one half inches tall, with a high forehead, small nose, oval chin, and medium mouth. Her oval face was dark complexioned and surrounded by black hair, and there is her confident signature, Winona H. Buck. At that time, Major Buck was assigned to Fort St. Michael near Nome, Alaska, and it's likely that the family was, uh, was going to visit their father. Over a posting to Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indianapolis, Major Buck took ill complications from some diseases he picked up in the Philippines, and he was sent to Walter Reed Hospital. There was a long convalescence. He recovered, returned to duty at Plattsburgh Barracks in New York, where he was promoted colonel of the infantry. He was again taken ill and again sent to Walter Reed, where at the age of 56, he died in 1912. The cause of death was attributed to, quote, oriental disease, unquote, contracted in the Philippines. He was buried with honors in Arlington National Cemetery. Bereft of her husband, Winona was also losing her daughters. Her eldest worked in the New York public library system before marrying a military man named Vincent Elmore. The youngest daughter, Leroy, also married a career soldier, Oliver Andrews Dickinson. Each marriage produced at least three grandchildren. Winona moved to San Diego and bought a house there. It was one of the stops that Major Buck had, had made in his military career. She was joined by her daughter, Louise, who had just finished her studies at the University of Wisconsin. The household also accommodated Winona's widowed mother. Louise married a San Diego architect by the name of Frank O. Wells. It was his second marriage. Mr. Wells was descended from some of the very early pioneers of Arizona, and he developed an architectural style that drew upon Spanish and American Indian influences of the Southwest. His buildings today are so distinctive that his name is regularly found in the classified ads of the San Diego newspapers when one of his buildings comes up for sale or rent. In 1926, Winona moved to a new house designed by her son-in-law. The San Diego Union detailed the features of the house, which is still standing at 4367 Arista Drive, under a three-column headline, Beautiful New Home in Mission Hills, replete with modern appointments. This three-bedroom, two-bath house enjoyed a view of Mission Beach and the La Jolla Shore. Winona shared this house with her daughter and her son-in-law. In March of 1935, at the age of 78, Winona Lee Hawthorne Buck died in San Diego, California. And in June of that year, she was laid to rest next to her husband, in Arlington National Cemetery. Buried nearby are her parents, and a decade later they were joined by her brother, Harry, who had been awarded the Medal of Honor. Although Winona appears to have lost touch with her alma mater, the 1926 alumni director, directory lists her as deceased. Her children knew about her place in university history. In 1942, the winter issue of the Cincinnati Alumnus Magazine reports a visit to the UC campus by Mrs. Oliver A. Dickinson of Fort Knox, Kentucky. Mrs. Dickinson's mother, according to the alumnus, was, quote, the university's 
first co-ed. One would like to imagine that our classical scholar, veteran of frontier postings and coast-to-coast -coast travel kind of smiled. Henry Malachi Griffin graduated in 1886. He features prominently in a difficult chapter of the university's history because in the late 1880s, the city of Cincinnati set aside some land at the southern end of Burnett Woods for a new home for the university. The university found itself in court because the heirs of Charles McNicken filed suit to stop the university from moving off the old McNicken estate. It wasn't that the heirs were particularly devoted to keeping the university on the estate. The interest lay in proving that the city and the university had violated the terms of the McNicken will. That will specified that a university for white boys and girls be located state. Consequently, the heirs wanted to know if any, quote, colored students had been admitted to McMickens University. And called to the stand was Cornelius Comagius, mentioned earlier as an influence in founding the university. He was at this time chairman of the board and a longtime uh, champion. Do you know whether any colored pupils have ever been admitted to the university? Asked the attorney for the McMicken heirs, and Comagius replied, yes, a very distinguished one, graduated about five years ago. Now, given the timing of this testimony, he must have been referring to Henry Malachi Griffin, who graduated in 1886. Now, at the time of his graduation, the Cincinnati Commercial Tribune specifically identified him as colored, and the New York Freeman went further and specified that he was the very first non-white student to graduate from the University of Cincinnati. Griffin had a long road to that graduation and a distinguished career afterward, as we'll see. He first appears as an 11-year-old in the 1870 census for Gloucester County in the Delaware Valley of western New Jersey. His father is Peter Griffin, who was born in 1835 in Maryland, and suggests by that birthplace and birth date that he may have been a slave. But he was certainly a free resident of New Jersey by 1854 when he married Maria White. Henry is the fourth child and the eldest son in their family of eight children. The Griffins were farmers and most of them remained farming this land well into the 1900s. Henry had other plans. In 1882, he was in Cincinnati, enrolled as a freshman at the University of Cincinnati. Although he registered as Henry Malachi Griffin, the city directory for that year shows him as Harry Griffin, which was the name he used in the 1880 census. He was rooming with the Johnson family, Susie and Thomas, both teachers in the colored schools of Cincinnati who lived on Bar Street. It appears that he may have worked as a coachman while going through the university. He was very respected by his fellow students who elected him class orator. In 1886, the University of Cincinnati celebrated commencement at the Odeon Theater, and among the graduates, the Commercial Tribune noted Henry M. Griffin, receiving the degree of Bachelor of Arts. His thesis, preserved in the University of Cincinnati Libraries, is titled Aeschylus as a Poet and Religious Teacher. The New York Freeman of June 26, 1886, celebrated the especially noteworthy graduation of Harry M. Griffin for the reason that the will of the late Charles McMicken, who gave the money to found and maintain the university, forbade the admission of colored students. But times change, and the trustees have quietly ignored this proviso and freely admitted colored students, although Mr. Griffin is the first 
to receive a diploma. From Cincinnati, Griffin traveled west, and he found a position teaching in the colored schools of Sedalia, Missouri, near Kansas City. The local newspaper reports that he was assigned to classroom three of four at the Lincoln School. Although there's every indication that this school suffered inequality at a time when separate but equal was the rule. The Lincoln School had a good reputation. The Sedalia newspaper uh, touted its success, in fact, saying that the colored child is capable of high mental training is no longer doubted by intelligent observers, and Lincoln School is a standing answer to all who assert to the contrary. A few years later, the UC Bulletin listed Griffin among the alumni as a teacher in the Warrensburg schools, a little bit closer to Kansas City than Sedalia. Warrensburg's very first school, constructed by donations from the African American citizens, assisted by the Freedmen's Bureau, was the Howard School, originally organized in 1867. Griffin taught in the new building, opened in 1889. Two years of high school studies were added in the 1890s, and Griffin appears in the UC alumni directory as the principal of the high school program. Throughout the 1890s, Griffin is listed in the UC alumni roles as principal of Kansas City's Lincoln High School, but he was actually the vice principal under a formidable principal named G. N. Grisham. As principal of the school, Grisham had a platform for promoting racial equality, and he used it eloquently. Although his efforts to create an African-American political party were short-lived, he vehemently opposed the gradualism of leaders such as Booker T. Washington, who argued that American society was not yet ready for the educated black man. To a national 1897 audience at the American Negro Academy in Washington, D.C., Grisham announced a strong case for black scholars. Although a February 1898 item in the Colored Citizen notes that H.M. Griffin had accepted a position in New York City, in 1898, he's still listed among the faculty at Lincoln High School. And yet, the 1900 census finds Henry M. Griffin living in Queens, New York, and married to an Ohio native named Cora. The couple, who had been married about nine years in 1900, had no children. They are living with Bishop William Derrick, the president presiding bishop of the New York AME Church and his wife, and they're identified as cousins. Bishop Derrick was a prominent figure in New York at this time. He was politically active, and he was heavily involved in, with many of the people who created the Harlem Renaissance cultural flowering later in the city. Henry's occupation in that census is listed as a clerk at the post office, but he was already at work on the next stage of his career. The 1905 Medical Directory of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut reveals that H.M. Griffin had graduated from Long Island College Hospital in 1904, and he was practicing medicine in Harlem. Griffin would have been 43 to 45 years old time of his graduation from medical school. For the next 20 years, Griffin was an active member of the National Medical Association, the African American version of the American Medical Association. He was heavily involved with efforts to save the McDonough Hospital among the very few medical facilities for African Americans in New York. He was also an early adopter of the automobile. The New York Age reported in 1910, Dr. H. M. Griffin, who has his office on 135th Street, is the first one of our doctors to use an automobile. Dr. Griffin explains that he does not like the idea of those southern physicians getting ahead of New York 
and therefore he reaches, recently purchased a small runabout in which to make his professional calls. The doctor learned to run that car in a week, but he is taking little chances. He explains that he's well insured and there are a score of undertakers in the immediate vicinity and a hospital on the next corner. The car that Griffin registered with the state of New York was a Detamble, which was manufactured in Anderson, Indiana. The 1910 census finds Henry M. Griffin, a physician with his own practice, married to a Virginia native named Alice Griffin. According to the census, they were married in 1904, and it's not entirely certain what happened to the original Mrs. Griffin, but it's very likely that she died young. When Booker T. Washington visited New York in 1912, Griffin was on the platform party along with his former landlord, Bishop Derrick. A year later, Washington was contacted by a representative of the Urban League who was investigating segregation in New York hospitals, and Washington suggested that the Urban League investigator contact H.M. Griffin and another doctor and describe both of them as high-class men. Around that time, the Journal of the National Medical Association reported that Dr. Griffin had relocated to 132nd Street, where the University of Cincinnati alumni directories for 1920 and 26 find him. He remained active in the National Medical Association. He presented papers on a variety of topics, including obstetric practice. In 1930, it moved to New Jersey, living on Lake Street in Englewood. He was somewhere between 68 and 70 and still practicing medicine when he died in January of 1931. We're going to start a review of Herbert Cooper Wilson with Jesse James. And we're going to start with Jesse James because Dr. Wilson was 17 years old when he happened to stumble upon a horrific scene at Bridge Square in Northfield, Minnesota, the aftermath of a botched robbery by the Jesse James gang. The gang rode into Northfield expecting easy pickings from a uh, country bank, but the citizens of Northfield surprised them and fought back. In less than 10 minutes, three people lay dead, and the robbery was thwarted. Only Jesse and his brother Frank escaped, and they spent the next three years in hiding. Among the dead were two bandits, and a cashier at the bank, Joseph Lee Haywood, who refused to open the safe and was shot through the head. Haywood was a popular man, and his funeral drew most of the citizens of Northfield, including the faculty and students of Carleton College, located just outside the town. Haywood was the college treasurer, and the college closed the day of the funeral so that students and faculty could pay their last respects. Herbert Wilson was a sophomore at Carleton College at this time, and he may have attended Haywood's funeral in the company of William Wallace Payne, professor at Carleton of mathematics and natural philosophy. Although Payne was primarily educated in math and law, his interest was in astronomy, and particularly in educating the public about astronomy. Before joining the Carleton faculty, Payne had studied for a few summers at the Cincinnati Observatory, and the year after Haywood's funeral, he built a small observatory of his own at Carleton. Herbert Wilson was Payne's protege and special assistant in astronomy at this time. Herbert was born to Thomas and Ann Wilson in 1858. The Wilsons were among the pioneers of Minnesota, arriving from New York in 1855. Ann taught in the area's first school, 
and Thomas farmed and he built a sawmill. Young Herbert grew up with three brothers and a sister on the family spread just outside of Northfield. And as a boy, Herbert displayed a precocious interest in astronomy. Years later, he recalled lying outside on the family homestead, gazing skyward, filled with admiration and deep awe at the beautiful stars made by the hands of God. Minnesota was then on the edge of the western frontier, and American Indians and fighting regalia were a common sight as well. Thoughts of the dazzling heavens dominated my mind throughout my youth, Wilson said, but the very first thing that I can remember about my childhood does not concern, concern the stars, but rather the sight of a huge Indian who once interrupted my mad scramblings on the kitchen floor by suddenly appearing at the doorway. My amazement at that moment will never be equaled by any discoveries in the realm of starlight. Herbert was one of only four students admitted to Carlton's collegiate program in 1875. He was one of only three awarded the AB in 1879. By July of that year, Herbert was in Cincinnati. Undoubtedly, uh, with the encouragement of Professor Payne, he visited the University of Cincinnati's observatory. He made arrangements to begin graduate study there in 1880. The observatory, however, was suffering growing pains at this time. It originally overlooked the city from a building in Mount Adams, but it had been removed to very remote Mount Lookout in 1873 to escape city lights and smoke. And about that time, largely due to financial problems, the observatory was affiliated with the three-year-old University of Cincinnati. A distinguished astronomer by the name of Ormond Stone had been hired to revive and direct the observatory, but he seems to have spent the next eight years arguing with the university administration. Notably, uh, the rector, Reverend Thomas Vickers. Stone eventually tired of Vickers' interference and he resigned. With Stone's resignation, there was only one candidate for interim astronomer, and that was Herbert Cooper Wilson, who had been named temporary assistant just the year before. So in the fall of 1882, Wilson began a two-year term as astronomer pro tempore. That December, he married a Mount Lookout neighbor named Mary Ann Nichols, named also known as Molly, who had been a clerk at the Standard Publishing Company. They roomed with Molly's brother um, named R.C. Yoel, a few blocks from the observatory. The observatory attracted hundreds of visitors each year, mostly during the summer, and although he was described as shy, Wilson seems to have enjoyed opportunities such as these tours to educate the public about astronomy. Throughout his time in Cincinnati, he remained in contact with Professor Payne back at Carleton College, and when Payne founded a, an astronomy magazine called the Siberial Messenger, uh, Wilson regularly contributed articles. And it was from Carleton, through Payne's encouragement, that um, Wilson received his master's degree in 1882. Occasionally, the heavens provided a surprise for him. Each year, he found a comet to study. It's quoted in the New York Times uh, here, describing a, a comet. Some comets were great comets that could be seen with the naked eye. Photography was then cutting-edge technology for astronomy. And Wilson painstakingly painted images of comets on black cards in white watercolor. When his comet reports were published by the University of Cincinnati in 1884, they formed the nucleus of what would become his doctoral thesis. In 1884, the university found a new astronomer, Germaine Gildersleeve Porter, and Wilson returned to his role as an assistant astronomer. And although he continued to publish reports, he knew that his time in Cincinnati was drawing to a close. So he looked for another job and found one 
is a computer. Back then, in the absence of mechanical uh, adding machines, computers were humans who spent hours and hours and hours going over the detailed reports of astronomical readings and calibrating tables of, um, of data that could be examined by scientists. Wilson resigned from the university, and in June of 1886, President Cox notified the university's board of directors that the faculty had recommended a PhD for Wilson for six years of faithful work at the university and his successful pursuit of postgraduate studies. The University of Cincinnati parted with a dozen of its pupils last night at the graduation exercises at the Odeon. If you've been keeping track, you'll notice this is the same ceremony from which Henry Malachi Griffin graduated. Although the program was quite lengthy, it was highly entertaining, the candidates for degrees handled their respective subjects in a scholarly manner. Each of the graduates presented a lecture on some aspect of their studies, and last on the program was Herbert Cooper Wilson, who spoke on our knowledge of commons, his conclusion revealing the sense of wonder common to most astronomers. One happy influence comets do exert, exert, he said. They excite our curiosity and direct our thoughts to the contemplation of the grand problems of the universe which surrounds us. When his work at the Naval Observatory was done, Wilson returned to Northfield. He rejoined his mentor, Professor Payne, who had recently built a second observatory at Carleton College. Wilson's newly minted PhD provided professional respect for this facility. Wilson energized Carleton's astronomy program by adopting new techniques such as photography and the spectrograph which identified the chemical composition of celestial objects. E.E. E. Barnard, who was one of the preeminent photographic astronomers of the day, announced at a meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 1898 that one of Wilson's photographs of the Milky Way embraced, quote, all that has been done by photography up to the present time. Over the years, Wilson helped Payne construct yet another observatory at Carleton, this known as the Good Soul Observatory. Wilson studied solar eclipses, asteroids, nebulae, planets, and double stars. The Good Soul Observatory was involved in weather observation and operated a time service in the years leading up to the adoption of standard time. And until the Second World War, Goodsell ranked among the most prestigious observatories in the nation. Wilson was also known for his pedagogical skills, especially in his course on descriptive astronomy. His colleague, Kervin Ginrich, said that this course, although not required, came to be considered one of the very desirable courses of the junior year. There was always a treat in store at the end of the course, and it was an imaginary trip to the moon, upon which the class embarked with the teacher as the guide. Dr. Wilson, while always adhering to astronomical fact, gave freedom to his imagination as to the mode of travel through space. The scenes met with upon arrival were depicted by lantern slides of authentic lunar photographs. And without realizing what was happening, the students received a vivid, accurate, and lasting impression of the conditions upon the moon as they are revealed by the most careful study. Wilson helped Payne spread excitement about astronomy through the printed word. He served as the assistant editor of the Sidereal Messenger. He was later assistant editor and eventually editor of his successor, Popular Astronomy. It was a familiar sight for many years to see him walking between the observatory and the printing office, usually carrying a roll of proof. Herbert and Molly raised four children in Northfield, Ralph, Ruth, Mary, and Lo uh, Lewis. Molly died in 1824, and two years later, Wilson retired on a Carnegie 
Foundation pension. He married again that year to Florence Rice, who had been an active member of the Northfield community since arriving as a Carleton student some 25 years before. Florence owned a number of farm property, and the Wilsons were often away from Northfield watching over their investments. They usually summered at the Wilson family camp on Lake Bemidji in northern Minnesota, and they traveled to California for the fall and winter. It was in California that Wilson was hospitalized throughout the winter of 1938-39. He returned to Minnesota by automobile. He enjoyed a final summer at the family camp, but he fell ill again in October. At Christmas, Florence convened a Wilson family reunion, marking the first time in 60 years that Herbert, his three brothers, and their sister had been together for the holidays. On the morning of March 9, 1940, at the age of 81, Herbert Cooper Wilson died at his home in Northfield. In granting its first doctoral degree to Herbert Cooper Wilson, the University of Cincinnati chose a man whose influence continues to reverberate among those who direct their thoughts, as he said, to the contemplation of the grand problems of the universe which surrounds us. Thank you very much.